Hello everyone and thank you for tuning in. Um, before I really begin here, I would just like to give a little heads up. Um, my apartment is very close to a busy road, so even though it may be quiet in my place itself, you may hear cars and trucks going by. Um, so my apologies in advance. Um, but now back to the show. Uh, my name is McKenna Madison, and today I will be discussing the golden rhinoceros of Mapamgubwe. This tiny sculpture, so small it can fit just in the palm of your hand, has an immensely significant impact on archaeological discoveries and our understanding of ancient African societies as a whole. These ancient societies that exist in Africa have unfortunately been lost to history as a result of the very colonial and very Western centralized histories that have been told to us as we have grown up. So even though this sculpture is small, its significance to us as a whole is simply immense. To start things off here, I thought that I would discuss the sculpture itself. I will link a photo of the sculpture in the show notes so that you can understand each element that I will be talking about here. So this medieval artifact, which is thought to have been created sometime between 12 and 1300 AD, was first hand carved from wood. Um, it's unknown what type of wood the figurine is carved from, but it is most definitely wood. Um, it is a rhinoceros looking as though it's about to charge, so it has its head down and its little ears are perked up. There is a huge amount of detail in the carving um, on the body itself, complete with a little tail and even an indication of ribs that would have been visible on the rhino that was being depicted here. Hammered thin sheets of gold foil were then laid down on top of this wood carving and it covers every inch of the piece. There were also tiny nail heads visible on the cheeks and along the horn of the rhino. This piece, again, which is small enough to fit in the palm of your hand, um, was created during the ruling of the kingdom of Mapamgubwe. I will really dive into the history of this kingdom later, but for now, it's just a good introduction to the society I'll be discussing. This really, I guess, figurine was discovered in the early 1930s by white scholars a team of both experienced and unfortunately inexperienced archaeologists had assembled to dig up a section of the Great Hill of Mapamgubwe, where they had determined through pretty extensive research that there were likely items of importance buried there. One of the first items found and one of the only items still wholly intact was the golden rhino. This little rhino had been set upon a grave as a sort of marker or an indicator that the person buried below had some great significance to the society. And when the grave itself was excavated, it was found that there were actually two skeletons in this single grave. They had been posed in their graves too. They were sitting upright and facing the west, which would have been in the direction of a really beautiful African sunset. From what we know now about the skeletons in this grave, the golden rhino had been sitting on top of royals for hundreds of years. That's right, folks. This figurine was a gift to a royal in the middle of southern ancient Africa. We have a society with highly regarded individuals. If we have people who are viewed as better than the average citizen to have been buried in such a way and gifted such this treasure, then clearly there had to exist some sort of a strong class system. The ruling kingdom at the time that this carving would have been made was called Mapamgubwe. 
it is thought to have been the first African settlement in southern Africa as a whole. His kingdom was actually very wealthy and very powerful. The kingdom was located just on top of a literal gold mine. So gold and ivory were their two things that the kingdom was known for exporting, therefore making the golden rhinoceros all the more a treasure to the society. Actually, though, Mpumkabwe was a deeply involved trading nation. So this whole narrative that's been virtually erased from history, but in fact, there was a kingdom in Southern Africa that was flourishing in the early 13th century and was even involved in trading with countries such as China, India, and Egypt. And we know that they had an established trade system with these countries um, because porcelain from China, spices from India, and papyrus from Egypt were all found in this royal burial site. But even though this kingdom seems very wealthy at a glance, we will actually come to find out that the kingdom was founded on cattle herding, agriculture, and hunting and gathering. None of those things in and of themselves would make a country rich. So how is it that we have a royal and this rich figure of power um, while still most of the kingdom was, by comparison, relatively poor? I mean, clearly there's some sort of established class system here. You really get a sense of this division in the power and influence of each class when we visually look at the scenery. Where this gravesite was discovered was actually on top of the hill that overlooks the rolling savanna beneath. We get this picture revealed here of a sort of literal social stratification. You have the rulers and the elite living above the world on this hilltop, while the majority of the population with less money and living on their own are living beneath. So, this rhino figurine becomes immensely important. It provides us with this look into the past and it reveals a picture of a complex society that we don't often see painted in Africa, especially in ancient Africa. When this rhino was found in the early 1930s, South Africa was gripped heavily by a system of brutal racial segregation. Um, this would actually very soon evolve into apartheid. South Africans have long been taught that their history began with the first Dutch settlement and was is at what is now Cape Town, um, but back in 1652. The people who had existed in the area before the Dutch colonized this area were portrayed as these very primitive beings and were not given much of a second glance. To these South Africans, there was just no room in their racist narrative to be able to comprehend that a black civilization existed in the area almost 400 years before them, and on top of that, could make art from gold. This little golden rhino became a very powerful threat to the very foundation of the national ideology of South Africa. The rhino then becomes this sort of symbol of returning the narrative to the black people of South Africa. The push and pull over the returning of this narrative is really what has caused such unrest in South Africa for so long. Um, still, even to this day, when we are told, you know, to think of a powerful ancient civilization Oftentimes, the first civilization that will come to your mind is probably Egypt. And even though Egypt is located in Africa, there's this sort of disconnect with reality here um, as a result of our education system. For so long, these white researchers have claimed the role of writing the narrative of ancient Egyptian societies that we often forget that Egyptians were and are black. 
even in our elementary school curriculum today, there's this lack of focus on the history of Africa as a whole. And to me, this little golden rhinoceros, though it's very small in stature, it has become a very powerful physical reminder of the great achievements of the African people and the incredible ancient kingdom of Mapamugwe.